No sooner had we left the trench that we found ourselves under fire from Franco's reinforcements. Bullets were ricocheting past us from the rear and front alike, and people were dropping dead on all sides. In the course of the retreat we had to get across the bridge that lies at the very foot of the Alcázar. As it was being bombed, quite a few men threw themselves into the river with their rifles and tried to swim for it. Many drowned, but others made it to the other side. Good morning to everyone, I'm Pep and this is the Spanish Civil War. In this channel and for the next three years we will follow week by week the Spanish Civil War, its battles and the Holocaust that it provoked. This week is one of those transcendental weeks that shaped the fate of Spanish Civil War, its narrative and the future of the country. As two main events, the relief of the Alcázar and Franco's ascension to power took place. For today's episode, I'm following mostly Paul's Preston biography of Franco, mainly the chapter called The Making of a Caudillo. Focusing in these two main events of the week may mean omitting other details that will be covered, if needed, during the next week. So, even if the lyrics of the song we took our episode title from suggest an end to the war by Christmas, as that seems all the wars are supposed to be over by Christmas, in this case with the hanging of the rebel generals, this week one of these generals, the one that joined the coup at the last moment, will rise above the others. During this last month, Kindelan, Nicolás Franco, Orgaz Yoldi, Yahweh and Millán Astray campaigned with the aim of making Franco the head of the rebellion. They kinda created a lobby in support of the general. Kindelan and Orgat did this believing that Franco was a dedicated monarchist, giving priority to the restoration of the king. We must remind that Alfonso XII was Franco's best man. On Monday the 21st there's a meeting in the shed of the airbase of Salamanca, between the members of the Junta de Defensa Nacional. According to Kindelan, after a three and a half hour meeting, they still could not get steer the discussion to the argument of the commander in chief. After the lunch, they went back and the issue was put on the table. Cabanellas, head of the junta, opposed it. He was convinced that the junta was enough, but an election took place. One among the four generals of the song will become the head of the army. I repeat this, the head of the army, not yet the state. Cabanellas, the elder general, the only one that was in command of a division when everything started, had been a deputy for Jaén for the radicals during the Republic and was also a Freemason, so it seemed difficult for him to be the chosen one, also because he opposed the creation of this post. Capo de Llano, had a career full of conspiracy and insubordination, had family links with Alcalá Zamora and benefited from the Republic. And if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, the publication of his radio speech in the newspaper had to be censored. He was not a good fit. Mola was just a brigadier general. Even if he was the mind behind the conspiracy, plans. He was outmaneuvered by Franco, his contacts and successes. Mola thought it was fine to give Franco the military command, as he personally expected to take part in the post-war distribution of powers. That leaves us with Franco. Miss Canarias. He joined the coup late but was a prestigious general, the youngest general in Europe. He had the support of Germany and Italy, and this week will make one decision that will make his popularity skyrocket. According to Preston, the timing here is crucial. After being elected as head of the army, the 21st of September, in the afternoon, the Army of Africa reached Maqueda. And ordered by Franco, they turned south 
towards Toledo instead of heading north towards Madrid. Franco would not issue any orders for the next three days, as the army is heading to Toledo in order to relieve the Alcázar. The 22nd will see the fall of Oropesa. As the rebels advance, the loyalist troops besieging the Alcázar try to storm it again. They capture the buildings in the periphery. The army of Africa is just six kilometers away, even though it's important to note that it will take the same for the army of Africa to go from Talavera to Toledo that was has taken to it to get from Sevilla to Badajoz. The Republicans are getting stronger, but the situation is getting desperate. The 23rd Varela arrives to take over the command from Yahweh, who was against the march on Toledo. That day, two more loyalist attacks are repelled in the Alcázar. By the 26th, the rebels are already there, and the 27th, a last attempt of taking the fortress takes place as a furious battle for the city anxious. As the day progresses, it seems clear that the rebels are getting the upper hand. We've started our episode with a quote of a Republican survivor of this last fight in Toledo. By the night of the 27th, Varela meets with Moscardo. All quiet in the Alcázar. Journalists are not allowed to enter the city. No prisoners are taken. During this week, Yahweh, Milana Stray and Nicolas Franco ask for another meeting of the Junta in order to redefine the powers of the Generalissimo, linking this position to the one of the head of state. This meeting will be held tomorrow, Monday the 28th. Now, here's what Preston suggests. General Franco knew about the bit of power that Kindelan and his brothers were planning. And as soon as he becomes Generalissimo, head of the army, on the afternoon of the 21st, he gave the order to relieve the Alcázar. Mola would say later on that it was Franco's personal decision to relieve the fortress. In December, in an interview, Franco himself would say, we committed a military error, and we committed it deliberately. That decision was aimed at boosting his popularity for the incoming big foot power. And he was able to do it because the same day he gave the order, he was promoted to Generalissimo. So, during the celebration for the relief of the fortress, Yahweh shouted, Tomorrow we will have in him our Generalissimo, the head of state. The stage was set. We will come back to the Alcázar and Franco's bid for power next week. But for now, we have to take a look at what happened elsewhere. As in the north, there is good news for the Republic. Most of the Republican navy that was blocking the strait arrives to the north in order to stop the rebel advances and provide the troops with ammunition and weapons. The rebel advance is then effectively stopped in Guipúzcoa. This same week that Manuel Dirujo, a member of the PNB, the Nationalist Basque Party enters the government as minister without ministry. This was in line with Largo Caballero's intention of a real united front against fascism. In the rear guard this week, the CCMAC, Catalonia Central Committee of Anti-Fascist Militias, created the first week of the war, is dissolved. This dissolution will be effective next week. And the anarchists, the CNT, join the Catalan government. If you think about it, that's something unimaginable for almost anyone. Anarchists in the government. Unbelievable. Unbelievable for most of the anarchists and for most of the middle classes or liberal republicans. But did they have any other choice? Okay. We've said that the state melted away at the beginning of the coup and it has to be rebuilt. The CNT, the anarchists, logically didn't want to rebuild the state. There was a revolutionary process ongoing, with land redistributions, collectivizations. To get out of this revolutionary situation, maintaining its achievements, 
and without rebuilding the traditional state, the anarchists advocated for a union state managed by the trade unions CNT and UGT. But in reality nobody supported them, so they had no choice than to join the other forces in the struggle against the rebels in the parliamentary area, or fight the war for themselves. That compromise, that entrenched the government, won't mean the immediate end of the revolution, but even if it will take its time, it's the beginning of the end, and the beginning of anarchist predominance in Catalonia and in all the regions of Spain. But apart from the CNT, this week another party joins the Catalan government, Andreus Nin's communist anti-Stalinist poem, Unified Marxist Workers' Party. You may remember this party linked to George Orwell's homage to Catalonia. On the rebel side, the zone near Huelva, El Cerro de Andévalo, falls under rebel hands this week. We've already have color as if it was in hands of the rebels, sorry for this mistake, but the truth is that there has been a siege ongoing for three weeks. As usual, repression will follow. Continue with the Republican Rear Guard, this week the Red Terror claims the life of 126 people that are killed the 26th in Madrid. Meanwhile, in Alacan, a phalangist is detained and the first attempt to liberate José Antonio Primo de Rivera fails. And, as usual, a couple of notes to end the week. We saw last week how the island of Fernando Po joined the rebels. This week, the 22nd, the continental part of Spanish Equatorial Guinea joins the rebels too. Also, the 24th of September, according to Bibor, Preston gives no date, Valladolid's rebel governor forbids the people from going to watch the executions that had become a sort of show. Between 3,000 and 15,000 people will be killed, and most of the deaths were not recorded. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe us. If you enjoyed it, share it. We have to bring light to the history of Spain. If you are able to support us in our Patreon channel, as these heroes already did, and offer as a coffee, this could also be great and would help us to carry on and improve the project. Let's make this possible together. Thanks for your attention. Goodbye and salute.